everyone. Thank you for joining our discussion on Riot's diversity and inclusion journey. Riot has learned and grown a lot over the years, and we want to spend this time with you to share what we've done and what you can do every day uh, to either start or accelerate your own DNI journey. This isn't really a typical presentation format. Think of it more as a fireside chat between two members of the DNI team. Um, we're going to be asking each other questions that we typically hear from folks who are interested in learning more about our company and, uh, and, and especially about our cultural transformation. So to start with that, my name is Sohal Sabawi, uh, and my role on the DNI team is to lead our diversity inclusion efforts on products, on games, and in gaming experiences. So think of it as like, you know, representation, um, leveling up the craft of our creative department. And I am joined by my awesome teammate, Audrey. Thanks. So, uh, so hi, everyone. It's great to be here with you virtually. Uh, just excited to have this conversation and do it in a way that is just, um, you know, real about how how we are standing up DNI at Riot and and giving you all some honest perspectives of how companies evolve over time. So, so excited to do it. Um, so I support all of our internal initiatives at Riot. So if you think about org health, so the sentiment data we gather, uh, learning initiatives, supporting our employee resource groups, partnering with our executive team to make sure that they have the resources that they need to be successful. All of those pulse check, heartbeat uh, parts of DNI internally at Riot is what I do. So I'll tell you all about it today. Um, but as Soha shared, really what we want to do is have a conversation with each other. So we're going to be asking each other questions that we're both curious about to lean into a little bit more and hopefully leave you all with some tangible takeaways, uh, recognizing that no matter where you are in the game development world, where you are in your career, I think what's really cool about DNI at the end of the day is its accessibility. So both what you can do to stand up big initiatives at your company, cultural transformation work, as Soha mentioned, but also what you can be doing as an individual. What is the perspective that you can take into your own evolution as a person, and then also your company's evolution too. So um, with that, so I did want to ask you to kind of kick us off and thinking about, um, you know, really every company has a catalyst to bring them to diversity and inclusion work. Could be in your founding as a company, kind of part of your, your manifesto, your value system. Um, or it could be something that just is a stumble along the way that that forces you to look at your culture a little bit differently. And I know so how you joined Riot five years ago. Um, so how would you describe Riot's catalyst? That's a great question, because when I joined five years ago, um, so this would have been 2015, uh, it was pretty rare for a gaming studio to have a full time DNI practitioner. Um, so I was the first and for about three and a half years, the only, and because it was so rare and it was still very new, it was a, it was a new muscle for people to build. Um, I wanted to really make sure at the time I thought this was the great idea, but who knows, uh, that I was <laughs> not necessarily rocking the boat. So building shared mm -hmm. language, building an understanding, easing people into it, because there was still a lot of misconceptions that a lot of folks at Riot now see as a given, weren't a given mm. five years ago. Um, and so what I learned to do was figure out what the existing structures and strategies were in the company and embed my way into them. So for example, our talent acquisition um, or recruiting strategy, it was really about like, okay, so we, we not really getting into the process, but saying, you know, maybe we use a vendor to name check and make sure that like our job descriptions had more neutral language, um, but mm -hmm. not necessarily changing anything fundamentally, just really looking at it from a perspective of like, I am easing in and I am teaching people along the way. And that is how I'm going to get buy-in, which is, which can be really difficult to have, to, to have at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And then in 2018, these efforts accelerated into what I would say is like the catalyst moment that um, really defined our prioritization of DNI as a company. So, as many of you watching this probably already know, 
um, many women, both former rioters and current rioters, publicly spoke out about a culture of sexism, how they felt unsafe, unheard, unrepresented, and um, rioters of all genders around the world demanded change as a result of that. And I think for me, the biggest realization during that time was, you know, I was so concerned with getting deep into the company and embedding DNI practices on top of it that mm. we didn't as like a as a company we didn't really change some of the fundamental issues that were blocking us so i used recruiting as an example it's well known that historically riot has prioritized the hiring of core gamers and so it doesn't really matter if our language is gender neutral if our um, if we're going to historically black colleges and universities to recruit, if we're diversifying the pipeline, because the biggest obstacle was by the time people learned that like, hey, we, we uh, interview a lot of people in the process, but we're really looking for a core gamer for like every job. That's when they started, to, you start to pull out. Um, and, yeah. and we used words to describe our company like meritocracy. And for those of you who might not be familiar, there's a bunch of research out there that that shows companies that call themselves or refer to themselves or, as a meritocracy are actually more likely to uh, show signs of bias or um, or have bias in their systems. And, and the reason is because I think like people look at it as more of intention and then they make the assumption like, well, we're a meritocracy. I'm making the assumption that we're a meritocracy. So we don't have to do anything to really make sure that that's the case. So mm -hmm. um, a wonderful and much needed outcome from all of these changes uh, that we went through. And when I mean changes, I mean, we completely redid our investigation process. We, uh, we did an entirely like over, an entire overhaul of our performance management systems, compensation systems, recruiting, um, personal development. Um, yeah. And we also started to think very seriously about who was at the table. So we hired our first chief diversity officer, Angela Roseborough, and she grew the team to over 10 people, which I definitely <laughs> needed at the time and still <laughs> need to today. And uh, right now the DNI team at Riot, you know, we're over 10 people. We just hired a couple of more that's also pretty rare for the gaming industry now. So having started from a position of, yeah, it's, it's not, it's not usual to have this many people on a DNI team. Um, so going from a place where even having a DNI person was new, now we have so many and we're split into, we're organized into two ways. We have the internal side of DNI, which Audrey mentioned, and then uh, we have the external side. So our strategic partnerships, community outreach, internships, products for where I sit. And yeah, I'm just so grateful that that was one of the outcomes because Audrey, I needed you and I needed multiple <laughs> of you. <laughs> so, you know, you've now been at Riot for about a year, right? Mm -hmm. It'll be a year and se seven days. So yes, you can say a year. So how would you describe where Riot was when you joined? And yeah. what did you see as some of the biggest opportunities as a result of that? Yeah, you know, you're talking about Riot's catalyst into this work, and I think it's, it's really interesting. So I've spent 10 years uh, primarily as a consultant before Riot. So I would go into different companies and help them understand the status of their org health, what are the greatest opportunities uh, for them to make the type of culture shifts that reflect their values, reflect the product and the market that they're serving. And, you know, I can say with absolute certainty that every company that has ever been a company goes through these moments of a mirror in front of them and asking themselves the question of who do we want to be from here? And that could be something like Riot as an example, which was at the time uh, 12 years old as a company, 
um, operating as a highly functioning startup that really thrived in autonomy and a culture that can move fast with really brilliant and passionate people. Um, but wanting to see what that transition would be into a true maturation as a company. So those are your people systems. Those are um, equitable practices to sustain folks, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But I can tell you equal stories across the board with completely different catalysts. Maybe you're shifting, you know, you could be a 40 year old company shifting to a more M&A model of merger and acquisitions where you are constantly bringing in new companies under your umbrella and trying to figure out what your center core, your culture would be completely adjusting your workforce and structure to shift to whatever market you're serving. Um, I think right now with what we're going through with COVID is we're seeing a lot of really big companies and small companies having to downsize to stay afloat. And when you downsize, that makes you re-look at your culture and make sure that the folks that you do keep not only help you keep the lights on and function, but can help keep the fire of whatever magic you're bringing into the world uh, is lit. And that's a very difficult thing to do. Um, and then you also have moments of external pressure, right? Where the world starts to see your brand differently, or they have a different demand for how they want to interact. And that has been, you know, truly the theme of the past five years is, how we as individuals interact with companies and the expectations we have for companies has changed, which means that companies themselves have to change. So I say all that because uh, for everyone who's listening with us today, your organization, your practice, your studio is not exempt from these moments. And the sooner that you become more curious to look at your culture and not make assumptions of, as Soha shared, you know, that you are a meritocracy or you do have inclusive process in your product development. Even if those things are in place and part of the system that you built, you need to question it constantly and be open to the fact that you as a culture and an individual and a company are going to evolve. So when I think about Riot and when I came a year ago, it wasn't just that big moment that most of the world looks at Riot as, as the culture that was broken and needed to be fixed. But it was also right next to that, a pivotal phase in the company's evolution to mature. And, you know, I say mature in a very, uh, uh, from, a, from this, the systems standpoint, from an organizational standpoint. So alongside building our DNI initiatives, we re-leveled our company through job architecture. We look at equity from almost every standpoint where DNI can be embedded in the people systems we're building. But we think about performance management, right? What are the actual structures that we can build as a company to keep our talent and know how our talent is doing? We can't make assumptions even based off of an annual survey that someone is able to grow their career at, at your organization. And we and need to build add, them. Yeah. On top of that, we were also for the first time putting the S in Riot Games, where yes. like we were so we changed everything at once almost. And for mm -hmm. the first time, we're launching more titles besides League of Legends or or yeah. different on different platforms, different genres, and we are still continuing. And so it absolutely is a matter of this moment is, is DNI is right in the center of it, but mm -hmm. so many things were changing at the same time, which which can be very yeah. exhausting. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's difficult, you know, and I think that any kind of cultural transformation that your organization is going to go through is going to be pretty spiky. And as long as you can can sustain whatever that pace is, is what's going to help you evolve in the ways that you want. And you have to be ready for the hiccups. 
because just like you as an individual person experiences in yourself, companies experience that too. And so the more systems and open questioning that you can bring into your processes as growing your company and whatever narrative you're bringing into the world is gonna be super, super valuable. And Bright is just doing it at scale and has a very uh, large audience watching us do it, which I also think is, is pretty interesting. Um, so for me personally, coming into Riot, to be part of that building was really exciting to me. And you don't have to be in DNI to be part of that building. You know, again, no matter where you're sitting from today, get more curious about how the company or companies you work with are evolving and how you want to be actively involved in that. Um, and so I mentioned a little bit about our team structure um, and how we're, we're really focus both on our internal efforts and our external efforts of, of, of the relationships that we're building. And something that I think is really powerful, and if you hear our leaders, Shayla Lawson or Angela Roseboro talk externally about using the example of our external partnerships, we're not going out into the world with the end result in mind, which is let's say recruiting, right? We want to bring more diverse and interesting folks to Riot, right? That could be diversity of life experience. It could be professional craft and background. There's so many different ways that you can bring a unique aspect into a company. But while the end result might be we're bringing in more people to Riot, the core and the focus is making sure that people understand who Riot is and that we're building really strong relationships with whatever space we step into. So that could be an external partnership. It could be with universities. It could be with Soha, uh, really partnering with the business uh, internally to make better products, tell better stories. It could be from my vantage point of just building more trust for our managers, more trust for our senior leaders to feel like they are supported and they can actually do this work. Um, so if, alongside your structure, make sure that you're not going too fast to drive to whatever outcome you want, because what you're going to miss is the richness and the sustainability within the practice that you're rolling out. And that is across any part of a DNI strategy or initiative. And I, I definitely can talk about it more if you're interested. Um, but Soha, I wanted to ask you, because especially for this audience, uh, we could probably talk about this for a long time. I'm also gonna guess that this is your dream job. Um, <laughs> it's very rare that somebody gets to pretty much completely focus their time on helping our products think more inclusively. And you know I'd love to talk to you about this. Um, but I'm curious, first of all, how has this transition been for you from doing literally everything to strictly partnering with our business to tell these stories differently? Um, and how would you describe the progress that we've made in products? Because I would yeah. say that what's really interesting is we've made a ton of progress in this space in ways faster than than other parts of our DNI strategy, which is pretty incredible. So I would love for you to talk about it a little bit. Yeah. So just as like background on me, games are my first love. Um, I hmm. remember being, I think I was six or seven, like sneaking into our family PC room and just like playing games on floppy disks that I wasn't allowed to play alone, but found ways hmm. to do it anyway. Um, and so I've loved games since I was very, very young, and they were the primary ways of how I built a lot of relationships. Um, you know, mm -hmm. my significant other, I would not have met him had I not been in games. Some of my best friends I would not have met if I wasn't in games. And so to me, um, it, my two loves at the end of the day are really around like sharing stories that resonate with people who don't think stories belong to them. So whether they're in a demographic where they typically see a video game protagonist who's uh, a white cishet man who's like gruff and doesn't really have feelings, or if his feelings, if he does have feelings, they're angst or just like grit and not being <laughs> able to 
themselves in terms of, you know, as a person of color or a person from the LGBTQIA plus community or, um, you know, as really anybody who doesn't fit the default in in where a lot of the game industry tends to go in. And I, and I want to say um, the game industry is really improving on these on these move on these efforts to begin with, we're seeing a lot more diversity. We are seeing a lot more stories that like feel bold, they feel fresh, and so I definitely want to give credit to where credits due that we are not the only company um, to start really thinking about this seriously. But as Audrey mentioned, you know I had to focus on everything at the very beginning, everything from how we develop our people to how we um, think about our brand to recruiting and and all of that. And I never really got the opportunity to step into the creative space or into the product space. And so by the time we hit our cultural transformation, that's actually when I feel like another catalyst happened within our creative team and our creative department, because people started comparing, you know, like if, if we made games or if we made champions or agents or stories, that resonated with more diverse audiences, we could have more people see Riot as a place to work um, or, or, re or consider our brand to be something aspirational. And that is when we were starting to think more seriously about you know, what kinds of stories we want to tell. And, and it really is, you know, it's kind of a chicken and egg because it's like the more diverse your company grows and you're a creative company or an entertainment company, the more likely that you're going to have diverse outputs from that. And we were just at a point where I, I wouldn't say that we had a ton um, or that we are catering to a very specific audience. And now we see the beauty of catering to a lot of different audiences. Like we're launching a mobile game. Mobile games have way more women playing than PC games. Um, and it's been really amazing because, you know, I was expecting to be let down gently when trying to get into the space and trying to speak to um, our products about like, hey, let's think about representation. Um, but I have actually been a little bit overwhelmed with how many of our product leads have been asking for guidance, for support, for education. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's interesting because I'm kind of starting from a place that I started at when I first joined Riot, which is building a shared language. You know, people mm -hmm. will people will hear words like tokenism or stereotypes, and they'll understand that that's something they should avoid, but they're not exactly sure how to identify it. So, um, a lot of the work that I've been doing uh, on on the on the one hand is education based, and it's being received almost too well <laughs> in the sense that like, you know, people are really digging into it and, and they want it and they want to share it and they want to learn more and they want to roll it out to their teams. And the leadership support has been phenomenal in that, in that case. Um, and I don't think we could have gotten here had it not been for what we had to um, reconsider about our culture and our, and our path forward internally. Um, mm. the other hand, and this is where Audrey, you lean in as well, uh, so we have employee resource groups that we refer to as rider identity groups. And um, mm -hmm. they have been a phenomenal partner when it comes to connecting our product teams directly with them so that they can give experiences, they can give the North Star of what representation means to them. Mm -hmm. And I think the best example um, and the most prominent example that at least I can share at the moment um, is releasing Senna. Senna is our mm -hmm. first black female champion. And there are two things that I absolutely love about Senna's story. First of all, for those of you who've been playing League of Legends from the beginning, you've already known Senna as Lucian's wife and she is trapped in a lantern. Her soul is trapped in a lantern by the very evil Thresh and what I love about releasing Senna as a champion is that she's now out. She freed herself and she's now a fully actualized um, champion who she tells her own story. And on the one hand, it's like really sweet that she gets to be with Lucian again. 
but it's really cool that it's like you are now your own individual like agent in life like you are now a fully actualized character with a personality and a backstory that isn't just about you know being trapped or or being that fridged woman as the the, the trope goes in in many many stories but i think what makes Senna especially special is that we could not have her visual design be what it's at without um, the help of Riot Noir, which is our group of Black rioters. Um, and they are one of six rioter identity groups. Officially six. Officially six. Yeah. And Riot Noir, in collaboration with the champion team, guided them in you know, what her hair should look like, what her skin tone should be, what her, um, what her voice should sound like. And this is just, Senna is one of many examples of iterations. We've now worked on about seven focus groups with different groups uh, that are very similar, where it's like, hey, we want to make a champion that resonates with an audience that we don't capture before, or we haven't captured before. What would great look like? And part of the education process for the champion team was really cool stuff like going to an African-American history museum in Los Angeles and actually getting like deep into the culture to see like what, you know, what, it's not really about me, right? It's not really about like what I think is cool. If I am a black player, who would I want to see? Um, and so Riot Noir really helped us answer that question. And as a result, we have this beautiful champion who's an incredible badass who, um, I just want her in every single one of our games as a result of that. But, you know, Senna was such a hit that I feel like the, the business case made itself. Um, you know, we, we really didn't have to kick the door down to, get, to have that mm -hmm. conversation. It felt very organic and it felt so welcome. And it's been such a great process, like I said, that we've repeated it several times across different product teams. And as a result, we just, you know, it's all about making that, experience better for all players that one day no matter where you are in the world you can pick up one of our games and you can see yourself in in some way represented or or pick up on um like a cultural signifier that maybe others wouldn't be able to pick up on those are the kind of beautiful moments that i just found yeah this is my dream job <laughs> i would have to say yes. I've, done, I've done diversity consultation work with um in my previous life with other studios and to really get into what would make players feel special, what would make them feel like they have a place to go to, they 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 have a space where they can um, fulfill their own power fantasy. That's really what gets me out of bed in the morning. Well, I wanted to ask you too, if you don't mind. I mean, for folks who are listening today and you know have an inclusive mindset in their process, right? So making sure that the stories that we tell are complex, nuanced, um, and don't tell a linear storyline of what it means to be whomever. Um, but I feel like there has to be some kind of magic in that process to help creative leads see it differently, see it kind of shift my mindset of, let me make sure I don't get it wrong versus what are the opportunities to tell a better, richer, more complicated story of a character that isn't part of a single trope. But, you know, it, it's hard to break out of that if you yourself don't really have that understanding of the folks that you, you want to represent. So it often translates into just tell me what to do and I won't get it wrong. <laughs> I don't want to mess it yeah. up. So um in your process working with the business what do you think really helped to shift that mindset and um you know dig a little bit deeper into that that story that we're telling yeah that's a great question because i i don't think we've 100 percent flipped it i think we've gotten to the mm -hmm. point where it's like the excitement and the want to do something and the drive is there but we're, we're right. still still have cases of folks just being like, OK, so should I just completely avoid this type of music forever? And and it's really about um, what I've 
appreciated about our leads is that they do ask questions more about opportunities and like power fantasies versus what should we completely avoid. So we don't start the conversation with don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. We start the conversation with what haven't you seen before that you would love to see? Um, what stories do you not see told? A, a great example is I was recently watching um, a panel on uh, by Netflix of, cre of black creatives who were talking about, you know, what they would want to see. And it was, it was really cool because it's like, you know, you don't really see like a, like black quirky, awkward girls who are just kind of like um, comfortable with being fun and silly. It, it tends to be pretty serious. And so that inspired me to start the conversation with, okay, as like, so for me as an Arab, I'm like, I've seen a lot of representation hits and miss recently watched the mummy again and went oh <laughs> of how my culture is represented and you know a lot of it is around like it's always a desert it's always a um uh it's always like camels and like scimitars and i'm like i grew up in jeddah which is like a metropolitan like flush city and you know i grew up with people asking me you know did, did you guys have to ride camels and i'm like one day i would just love to see like i don't know like people driving a mercedes or a lamborghini <laughs> in yeah. saudi arabia instead of yeah. instead of the kind of similar tropes so i feel like starting the mm -hmm. conversation like that immediately frames it so that when we are asking our writer identity group members, when we say like, we want to make a champion that X players feel um, they can identify with, we don't start with saying, tell us all the things you want us to avoid, which is like, whatever you've mm -hmm. seen before, that you would love to see. So maybe mm -hmm. it's a superhero you haven't seen before. Maybe it's a type of romance that you've never seen before. Um, mm -hmm. Or like a parent-child uh, parent relationship that is is not hasn't been told in slightly different ways over time it's just something completely new um mm -hmm. and i feel that way with a lot of like um you know a lot of lgbt content is about the coming out story and it's really you know having stories that just break that narrative or or just tell a different kind of narrative where it's like i'm already out people know or and yeah. Accepted and it's fine and it's not this like heartbreaking like you can have both we just tend to be oversaturated with one type of story so that's mm -hmm. what I, I feel like we've really unlocked um the potential in a lot of our creative department because we're also making new games and new, telling new stories and um and that is i feel like that's also creative fuel for mm -hmm. for people and be like, what if we did something like that in League? Or what if we did something like that in Valorant? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so we've talked at a high level a lot about Riot, a lot about us, our roles, um, our journey. But for folks who may either be in formal DNI positions or aspire to, or are in a situation where there isn't going to be a DNI practitioner joining their studio anytime mm -hmm. soon, what advice would you have everybody walk away with from this talk? Yeah, yeah, it's it's such a good question. And I'm going to share what for me personally is kind of the center to how I live my life, how I build any kind of DNI practice, any kind of DNI learning uh, that really is applicable, regardless if you're formally in a DNI position or you're in the business, which is commit to understanding yourself in the context of others. And what I mean by that is so often what we do when we're trying to learn more about DNI is that we look around us and we say, well, you're different from me. You're different from me. I need to learn how to interact with you better. Let me make sure I'm not saying the, the wrong thing to you. I don't want to commit a microaggression by accident. Let me just make sure I'm saying all these things right. And What's so interesting about that is at the end of the day, if we're operating just from trying to focus on everything outside of ourselves, 
But I can promise you, and there is so much social science that tells us that that practice is not sustainable. I could read every book about every experience of every person who's different from me, but the second I leave my house, it doesn't change the way that I see you and how I interact, period. That's just the truth and it stinks, but it's true. So if we go straight to building out initiatives, getting our education on unconscious bias, getting all, you know, checking the box on, I think, what are kind of the pillars of DNI, and you have it invested in your own self awareness, you're never going to make the progress that you want to make for yourself, for your company, for your product, for your market, whatever. Uh, it's just not going to stick. So when I say understand yourself in the context of others, what I mean is invest in understanding your story. Where are your roots come from? Uh, where do you get your value system? Why do you see someone from the perspective that you do? What do you guard about yourself? What do you protect the most? What ideologies are the hardest to let go? What feels better to agree in theory than in practice? What conversations are you terrified to have? These are really big questions to answer. But if you do that work, no matter who you are and whatever level of privilege that you carry respectively in each room that you enter, that is how you're going to make impact. And if you're a DNI professional, doing that work is going to make you build better programs. If you're a game developer, doing that work is going to make whatever story you're telling even more rich and probably the system that you're building to make your game even more interesting. Um, that is your, it should be the center of your work. Because when it comes to, the bigger things that we talked about, you know, the, the systems that help our company sustain itself, uh, our recruiting practices, our learning programs, our employee resource groups, uh, right, we call them our rigs, as Soha shared, you know, the, the kind of the, the pillars that hold the building up, none of it matters if you don't have a really strong understanding of your core and center and are committed to questioning that all the time. And I can say as a white woman, that is something that is so, so important to me. Um, if you are in the DNI space and are part of a majority group, you need to do that work. And if you're anyone who's part of a majority group, you need to do that work. And if you're anyone who's, who's underrepresented as well, you do that work and it looks different, you know? And so, um, I'm going to step off my soapbox because I can honestly so <laughs> I can do this forever. Because, you know, um, that, I feel like that really encapsulates a lot of my early journey at Riot, where it's like, mm. and even, you know, when people are thinking of like, okay, you're the first DNI professional, like, what's your plan? What programs are we going to get? Should we do this type of anti harassment training or that one? Like, which vendor do we? And it's, you get so caught up in that kind of work, which is important work. Yeah. Like, let, let's be honest, like these are foundational sure. things that could be super useful. Yeah. But it really, it doesn't really matter if the, the foundation and the core of who you are as either an individual, as a leader, as a company is what the issue is. Is this, is the thing that you haven't actually yeah. completely grappled with or mm -hmm. found a way to um, deconstruct or, yeah, no, I just can't plus one that enough because it really, it really changes everything when you're like, well, what is our, like, our cultural values had to change. You know, we used to call it the riot manifesto. We now call it our values. And even that terminology is a pretty, like, it's a pretty descriptive evolution from how we view ourselves um, mm -hmm. and how we mature as well. And, and again, to, to, reference what you already said, when we mean mature, we mean really like the actual growing and like moving forward as a company, not a, not necessarily an immaturity versus a maturity. It's just, mm -hmm. yeah, like getting to that next state. So yeah, that's great. And I also need that what advice. What would you say? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's constant, right? It, it, it never ends. Um, I don't know for you, 
to answer that same question, if you're in or outside of the DNI practice, um, what is your recommendation for, for investment? You know, before 2020, I probably would have had a completely different answer. Um, so I'm going to lean on something that actually, uh, this is advice I needed that I think we all give each other a lot, but you can't solve it all at the same time in one second, in one breath, and with one mm. strategy. Like this is work that changes and grows every single day. We had a beautiful 2020 roadmap and then COVID <laughs> hit. We had, and then we re, we redid our roadmap for a different beautiful 2020 roadmap. And then, you know, seeing the Black Lives Matter protests really just made us stop and say, okay, we, we need to, we play a role in this society too. And we need to find a way to like be a part of the change. And so honestly, give yourself a break. <laughs> Uh, let yourself off the hook. Um, there is the work will never end. And I don't mean that in like a scare tactic way. I mean, it really changes that much. If you were to tell me five years ago when I joined the company that we would be having, um, you know, like roundtables for our leaders around pronouns, around gender pronouns, I probably wouldn't have immediately thought of that as something that I, I would tackle in my career at Riot. But the conversations about pronouns socially has just, you know, it, it's really, mm -hmm. um, it's picked up speed. And, you know, people that put them in their Twitter profiles or they put them in their LinkedIn profiles. And, it, and it's a powerful thing to do. And more and more conferences that I, well, go to <laughs> before this year, it's, you know, it's on, you have a badge that, that you can choose to place your pronouns on and you see them on other people. And so, things are going to keep evolving. They're going to keep changing. And it's not a one and done deal. This is work that we have to do every day. And sometimes it can make you feel really weak and really drained and you can't solve it without focusing on yourself. I mean, I, I kind of went back to your point there of like, you got to start here, um, which I also need to learn how to do. <laughs> <laughs> so this I'll take my own advice yours. <laughs> That's also I'll, I'll take your advice. What's that? I said I'll take your advice too. So advice has been exchanged officially. All right. Next next one on one, let's check in with each other to see if we've actually done the thing. Deal. Um, well, thank you so much, Audrey, and thank you so much, everybody, for listening. Um, this is a story that we we do like to tell. We tell it in our employee orientation. Um, courses when we when we onboard new rioters you know we've been through a lot and it's it's on us to share back what we've learned because you know as we mentioned this is something that can happen to anyone and again not to to frame it as a scary thing but really especially with what's been going on in the world there could be many reasons that your your company has to suddenly shift and it, it takes a hard left takes a hard right or just like barrels <laughs> continues to barrel down in one direction that needs to be pivoted. So we hope that you've learned some things from us. Um, you can find me and Audrey on LinkedIn. And thank you again for having us. Thanks so much. Bye.